Okay, got it. I mean, sound off. Yeah. You'd think I would have figured that out by now, right? Been a full year of this. And yeah. actually, Jesse, I was sort of wishing we had tuned into a Twitch. I was thinking, here we go. This is going to be a fun day. I know. Oh, well, maybe next time we can just watch me play video games. But for today, <laughs> the stage is yours. Fantastic. Well, we will start with a little icebreaker here, James and Meredith. Um, because I'd love to hear, I always love to hear people's journey to where they came from to get to where they are. And so I'd love for you each to share just a short snippet of your journey to your current role and any advice you'd like to share for our audience. Um, it's maybe your personal best career advice. I can go first. Um, so it's lovely to be here. So I'm Meredith Dean. My journey. So I actually came from a consumer insights background. Um, I, you know, spent, let's say five years at a big research firm and always knew I wanted to be involved with brands and consumers, but ultimately I wanted to go from the vendor side to the brand side. So I joined PepsiCo basically exactly 10 years ago. I just had my 10 year anniversary. Um, so I joined in the, in the, analytics, thank you, and insights organization, and then had the opportunity to move into marketing after about three or four years. And I said, heck yeah, sign me up. So, you know, I've moved through a variety of brand innovation roles, and then had the opportunity to take on my current role, which is leading portfolio activation, as well as media. So um, I feel like I've been really gathering all sorts of tools to build myself as more of a general marketer, which is, you know, my passion. Um, best advice I would give is really like, say yes. Um, don't be afraid to take on the new experiences. Um, it's, it's scary. It's probably a good thing. If it's interesting and scary, it's a good thing. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, it's, it's hard, but try not to stay so vertically focused, right? Like I think, you know, especially I'm a millennial, I'm a, I'm a geriatric millennial, but we, we tend to be very, you know, upward focused on promotions and mobility, but like my best advice is, you know, don't be afraid to take a lateral position if it's going to give you a new experience that will help you grow long-term, you know, growth takes different trajectories. So that's, that's really been my philosophy and what I would give it as advice. I love that. James, how about you? Um, it's actually funny. It's very similar. Um, I actually started off and thought I was going to be a finance or a sales or a technologist because marketing always was fluffy and touchy feely, right? Um, until I started getting into it, it's awesome. It's the creative side of business. And so I grew up in real estate and I've started off back when, you know, was internet a thing, building websites in the early days, um, worked with a shift from, you know, agency side to bringing it in house, working in technology, working in health and wellness, kind of always gravitating back to real estate. Um, and it's, it's awesome. It's like, I love waking up every day thinking about how do you get into someone's head? How do you get into their, the psychology of it? We honestly, I think marketers should be psychologists as well. In terms of advice, I'd say, just be curious, you know, don't be afraid to step out into those new emerging technologies and those new opportunities, because that's where you find sometimes from those mistakes, but something that you've been looking for that you didn't know you had. Um, so just stay curious and really dig in deep. Don't take it at just surface level. A lot of people tell you certain things, but really kind of ask a lot of questions and try to deconstruct it to find out how to make it work for your brand, your product, your service, your customer, whoever that might be. Love that. I love the idea of continuing to tack in your career to challenge yourself. I love the advice about just always keeping yourself on that edge of, I'm a little uncomfortable, I'm a little anxious. And sometimes that gives you great, you know, great energy and gets you to challenge yourself. So let's pivot to the theme of the day, which is the future of media. And James, I love that you just said, is the, was the internet going to be a thing? I mean, the fact that that was ever anything that anyone thought seems right. hilarious now. I never thought that, just to be clear. <laughs> you were a forward My thinker. My bosses did, though. <laughs> right, exactly. You were building websites, and they were like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're like, I'm doing the future. So uh -huh. the future continues to change. I mean, obviously, there are so many opportunities that can get you excited and gets us out of bed every day. There's also challenges that keep us up at night. So that question of, is the glass half full? Is the glass half empty? I don't want to start with the glass half empty, but let's start with data because that's a super 
uh, let's just say at Vox Media, it's a big part of our focus right now. We just rolled out the third iteration of our Forte first party research um, and audience solution. And obviously we're coming to market trying to help marketers with what's gonna happen in this cookie list world that we're all heading into. But um, I know you each have a different perspective on this based on your industries. And James, I'm gonna start with you because I know there are some challenges you face because you're in a highly regulated industry. Yep. So I'd say- Beyond just me, privacy. Right. So I'd say for me, the glass is overflowing. <laughs> um, it's a good thing. It's not empty or full. It's overflowing. Um, I think for us, because we're highly regulated, um, it also had changed. I mean, a lot of the, we're, we have a wealth of data on consumers, what we do with home transactions, a lot of the third party data, let alone media. Um, so for us, it's been that shift where things I used to be able to use to segment audiences, I can't use anymore because of regulation changes in our industry. Um, and I think there's a collide that's happening where what we can do to protect the consumer, do the right thing versus some other people's understandings. And especially with a lot of the regulations with GDPR and the right to be forgotten and consumers being more savvy with their data and what that means. As long as we're doing the right thing, you're doing right by them. I think there's a definite place to create relevancy because, you know, we've all heard those stories when somebody buys something and then it stocks you run online from your shopping cart. For me, I think it's that's relevancy, right? But now it's created friction with the consumer. So how do we leverage that to really close that loop correctly, right? Stop stalking someone when they bought your service or your product, like really be respectful in that. So there's a lot of shifts that we've had to make in our approach nationally and globally, as well as regionally, but also trying to arm and educate our franchise owners and our independent contracting agents who have their own businesses within businesses within a really big brand how do they do it correctly? What are their opportunities? How do we work together and not cannibalize each other? Um, because of all this data, at the end of the day, I think we forget there's consumers involved. It's not just the KPI, the conversion, the metric, the whatever it is, there's people. And how do you connect people with people and respect that relationship? And especially as a brand person at you know my level, how do we honor that and bring them in, but then respect that local brand representative that's working with them. So I could keep going on, but that's kind of where we're at. Uh, but I do wonder whether you feel like brands can self-police. I mean, I think that so much of the privacy, all the laws that are coming, and you had the restrictions before GDPR and mm -hmm. CCPA even came into the, to the mm -hmm. forefront, but do we need to be policed? I mean, I'm wondering whether it's just a bad actor, so much it's just sort of ruined it for everybody. <laughs> I don't know if it's so much police as it is just making sure that we're a part of the process and respecting those relationships and doing the right thing. I mean, that's one of our mantras, but just doing the right thing for the consumer. And in our case, we have, you know, a B2B to the owner, a B2B next level to the agent and then the end consumer. So there's a lot of nuance we have to consider. But I think we have to make sure we're building the systems and infrastructure and the capabilities and the tools to allow everybody to do it correctly and use data in an appropriate, compliant way that helps, that doesn't create that friction or uh, distrust. So you're, you're ready. You're ready for what's you're coming. Ready. You're probably already there. And well, how about you? I mean, by no means are we, like, there's a lot yeah. coming still, so... <laughs> So Meredith, for you, how does that compare to what you're doing with the PepsiCo brands and CPG, the category in general? So I, I, when I hear data, I think, you know, I go right to audience um, and, you know, I feel really lucky that PepsiCo has put such a, a priority on audience data. And, you know, we have a whole team of folks dedicated to building what we call consumer DNA, which is really a combination of first party and second party data to help bring our audiences to life. And then we use that information combined with, you know, native signals and native audience data from our partners to hopefully activate in the best way, obviously combined with great creative and surrounding media with the right context, right? So I feel like I go right to audience and I think, you know, I wasn't going to go with overflowing. I was going to say glass half full, but we can go, <laughs> right? Like the, the opportunities are endless. And now it's like, 
we know so much um, about our consumers and deep insights. Like we know what tick, what makes them tick, right? Like this goes back to my love of insights and it's how can we activate quick enough, right? How can we iterate enough creative um, to activate against all of our audiences? You know, one of my big passions and, you know, passions within my day-to-day -day job is creative personalization, right? Like, can we create hundreds of different ads with different iterations of products and people and, you know, targeting based upon what we know about them and like the opportunities are endless, but our costs um, and our, you know, our pocketbooks aren't endless, right? So to create a million versions of creatives, it's a lot of money, right? So it's, you know, how do we get smarter and work with agencies and third parties who can help us and work with our vendors who can help us. Um, so I say like, that's the one thing that keeps me up at night is okay, like we've got all this amazing audience data, like how do we activate upon it and at scale without totally breaking the bank? <laughs> Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so you're thinking already about consumers and the audiences based on their behaviors rather than sort of the old fashioned demography, which we're not going to be able to use anymore. So you've already been thinking that way. Yeah, we have been, you know, it's been a journey. It's not overnight by any means. And I think one of the challenges is understanding the right balance of our own consumer DNA data with the native you know, audience information that our partners have, right? Like, which is better? What's the right balance? We don't necessarily want to target only on our data or only on their data, but like, how do we continue to optimize the mix and balance to make sure that we're, you know, reaching the right people with the, with the right messages? So I think, you know, we're, we're certainly on a journey. Do we have it perfected? No. Um, that's the nature of this industry, right? Like, it's always going to be changing. Um, but I feel, you know, thankfully PepsiCo has been working on this and trying to get ahead of the curve, um, you know, to really build our audience data internally. That's fantastic. I do think it's going to be interesting to see when we get to the point where frequency caps are no longer going to be a thing because you can't really follow someone around. You don't know, you can't follow, there's no ID to track them from place to place or from you know wall garden to wall garden. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like you both see a lot of opportunity and data will continue to be the thing where there's so much of it, but how you use it will be the discipline. I, yeah, and I think the shift that we've taken from demographic to audience-based approaches has actually created better engagement and better results and better stickiness with consumers. I mean. Instead of the average, you know, 25 to 54 adult predominant female with a household income of X, think of how many types of people fit in with, into that, right? So that's that in itself, when you think about people, it's it's having a big impact. Yeah, and I would say it's led to better creative, right? Like we do a lot of our audience work, we do that well before we even start our media planning so we can integrate it into the creative process, um, you know, along with all the other insights that the brand, you know, our brand teams have about consumers, but, you know, I think it's led us to stronger creative because we're thinking about the media audience way up front now. Yeah, I agree. It's also what keeps me up at night because that segmentation is what, how do you cut through the noise and how many versions of a six second do I need and how far can I go? And it's, it's daunting, but it's, it's like exciting. you're in my inbox, James. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to start a support group. Right. <laughs> excess creative that never sees the light of day. Yeah. I have to say, uh, being on the, the sales side of the industry, we do still receive a lot of RFPs that have demographic targeting. And it's Change just interesting. Hard. It changes very hard. It's hard. It's, uh, I, I feel like, you know, the agencies are in some cases leading the charge and in other situations, the clients are leading the charge, but it sounds like both of you are focused on what people do is oftentimes more important than their gender or their age or sometimes their geography, their education level. I mean, I, I feel like I still operate like a 29 year old in the way that I shop and cruise the web. So uh, you definitely can't even target. Find it's often what they're not doing is more important than what they are doing, right? Because that's how I can, how do I activate them? What do I need? And we've been bringing our creative agencies and our media agencies and those teams closer together in planning like we're, we've been working on next year for the last 60 days, but we're talking, how do, what do they need from a media perspective? 
but what's the output? How many versions of something do we need to start with? How many iterations might we need? So we can start planning for that when we get into next year's campaign. I love that, you, James. It's really yeah. not doing, right? It's not, you know, we need to understand what that trigger is in order to make that behavior change. I love that. So let's pivot a little bit to the idea of content, because when you're talking about behaviors and consumer behaviors, uh, a lot of the way that we measure what they do is what are they reading? What are they spending time with? Where are they sharing content? Um, and you both seem to feel, or you, you had expressed to me earlier that content is king. So I'd love to hear about how you're addressing creating content, the original content, whether you're using influencers, how do you approach that for each one of your brands or your portfolios, I should say. Meredith, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, yes, it's a passion point. You know, I think content is king and, you know, I would say maybe three to five years ago, we tended to think of them separately. Like we had paid media and then we had custom content and we had influencers and they're kind of three separate work streams. Um, but to the, to the end consumer, right? That they're all the same and they're all um, possible motivators of purchase. So I think, you know, I've been making a really big passion of mine to explore more custom content. You know, one of the things that, you know, we're really looking into is gaming, for instance, right? And how can we partner with, you know, gamers and streamers and integrate ourselves into that behavior that consumers are already, you know, engaging with and they're, you know, they're watching gamers, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube or wherever, right? How can we seamlessly integrate into what the what consumers are doing rather than just interrupt, interrupt, interrupt? Um, I think it's it's so important, especially like, you know, when I take off my job hat and I just put on my general consumer hat, right? Like I, when was the last time you really did that? <laughs> it's really, it's Every day. Hard. That's right. Every really day. hard, right? But you know, like I would say 50% or maybe more of my purchase decisions don't come from traditional advertising. They come from, you know, bloggers that I love. And I notice that they're consistently using a certain brand of chocolate chips or whatever it might be, right? And so I think it's establishing those mental connections in a more authentic way that is so important. And because consumers are smart, they're smarter than ever. And they know an ad when they see an ad and like there's, it can be off-putting to some people. So I personally think as brands, we need to be thinking about both sides, you know, traditional paid advertising as well as more custom integrated content that feels like less less like an ad because we need to reach reach consumers with both types or else we're never gonna you know get the conversion that we need so you mentioned that consumers are also super savvy and they know the difference but then you also said they don't really know the difference do you feel like the 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 key is to entertain them or is it i don't think so i think educate or i think it has to be enjoyable right and it has to yeah. feel authentic to that to that creator right like if we're going to integrate into a show or into you know with partner with the talent it has to feel authentic to who that person is and you know we have to understand with that let's say a blogger like what's their normal type of um content that they post right and we have to feel like it's the right brand you know I would hope that they would also say like we don't want to partner with you you're you know they would yeah. they would want that authentic connection um, but I think, you know, consumers, when they, you know, influencers have to say ad now, right? Like you, you can't disguise it, but I think when it's truly the right fit and the right match, um, consumers don't care as much, um, when it feels more authentic and not in your face. It's true. It's that you think about people talking about some of their favorite ads and then they realize that they actually do love ads. Yeah. <laughs> I love what you said, Meredith, because it's a yeah. shift that we went through in media. Think about native advertising when that buzz was coming in, right? Instead of like intruding and drawing away, we now have to meet them where they are, respect that experience, and find a way to integrate correctly. Totally. That. So James, how are you approaching the idea of content, branded content, paid media, like all yeah. of that? How does that fit into we, your world? So it's been a big shift for us the last few years. Um, I look at my agents as kind of those influencers, right? Because from a brand perspective, we have our message. 
but how they bring that brand to life and all the markets they serve is so different. And creating content from a brand can feel daunting and scary. Imagine them, like I feel their pain because they're like, I know how to buy and sell. I know how to build nurture relationships, but to create content. <laughs> so we've been working on providing tools for that. Um, like remaxhustle.com. It's a, it's a public site. If you guys want to check it out, it's a cool thing. Like how do they, we give it like 80 or 90% of the way there and let them co-brand or put their personal message in or give them tools to create their own custom content. And it's a little bit of that shift from a, yes, a branded approach has relevancy, but sometimes an unbranded approach also really creates more trust and more accessibility versus a consumer saying, oh, I'm getting sold something or there's a slant or a bias on that, right? So we've been encouraging the network to create local content. Yes, you might be an agent and you're talking about, you know, bedrooms and bathrooms and house counts. We tend to spew real estate speak on people. Pause and start thinking about what do they need? How does it live? What's the new restaurant in town? What's the walkability? Like how does the fabric of the community come together? And that's what you can create in an unbranded way in some regard, maybe it's just a pen, maybe it's just they're getting to know you and then hopefully when they get to that point, I need someone to help me with that big transaction of buying and selling or commercial or whatever that is, you're on the short list of consideration because you've built rapport and trust with the consumer. And so between apps and technology we've built and integration partners, we're trying to make content creation simple and automate not the effort, but the work that goes into it. So they can just template, use templates and customize, you know, tweak something, create one piece of content and have it automatically format for all the different social media platforms instead of having to go okay well here's my story now what how many outfits do i need okay what's the aspect ratio and stuff that they don't even need to understand how do we right. simplify that for them that's fantastic i have to say you're just the real estate industry in general what a year you've had just bananas the amount of inventory okay. that has been gobbled up and gobbled trying to up. fabricate now like we need to make listings <laughs> it's true make listings and uh oh. uh you know people are writing offers sight unseen it's it's been a, it's been a wild wild year. year and yeah and the low the localness of your industry too is very interesting you're right the idea of your agents being experts on the market that people are considering moving to because so many people have moved I mean, I think the whole state of California moved to Austin, Texas. Did that happen? <laughs> that's what it that's what it feels like. Yeah. Um, so has this changed your strategy as it relates to paid advertising? I'm just wondering the mix of content versus paid, or is it all part of the same ecosystem? I look at it as part of all one and the same. Obviously, the intention of paid ads, it used to be more top funnel as you get down, you're more lead gen, but now it's how do we, even on a local level and lower funnel tactics, whether it's the boosting of a post, a dark post, like there's different tactics on the paid side now to bring content to life or amplify that message. So for me, it's just become a little more complex, but they're, they're getting more and more integrated. Likewise. There, yeah. Meredith, is there one particular campaign you would point to where you would say, here's where we really got it right. This is something that we need to replicate. We, we had the right influencer or the right story or all the KPIs were delivered. Is there some best practice you could share since you have so many uh, you know, peer marketers watching you right now? Oh gosh, that is a tough one. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is actually something that we just launched. So we don't actually have the results yet. But I think the way we're going about it is so smart. Um, and this is, you know, so Chewy is one of our brands that we support. And, you know, we, we've we launched this program called Camp Chewy. And it's really, you know, founded in our brand purpose as well as um, the current times, which is, you know, Chewy is all about fueling kids play um, and play, you know, as you are, you know, not trying to force kids into a type of play. Um, and camp is obviously a huge part of that, but one of the things that, you know, with the economic times and with COVID kids haven't gotten a chance to go to camp, not everybody can afford to go to camp. So, um, you know, we've been focused on, you know, how can we be a facilitator and let kids go to camp? So, you know, we have an in-store promotion, but we also have a new partnership with Andy Grammer and the American Camp Association. And, you know, it's, it's basically, he's gonna be helping write a song with um, 
user submitted lyrics. So he will write the tune um, using some of the lyrics that are submitted. And for every submission, it's um, a dollar will be donated to the, the American Camp Association. It's really to this, this fund that we are then going to the American Camp Association. So there's a really great, you know, like influencer approach um, that's tied to, you know, more of our traditional in-store promotion, which is all about, you know, creating this camp experience at home where kids can win these kits. So, you know, we've really created this 360 degree plan to bring together the, the American Camp Association portion and the Andy Graham portion with our more traditional paid advertising, which is in support of our in-store promotion to really think about it as a 360 plan. You know, I think it's the first the first time, at least in the last few months that I've seen us really take a 360 approach when it comes to um, a consumer promotion tied to a national media plan, also tied to um, a content partnership. So and also tied I'm really to, excited. Yeah, and purpose and mission rooted in there too, which I Absolutely. think is- like that's the common thread that ties everything together. Like this is all rooted in Chewy's purpose, which is fueling play. Um, and, you know, being the advocate and the catalyst for kids to be allowed to play as they are. So, you know, I'm super excited for the promotion and the whole partnership. That's that awesome. is exciting. I love that example. James, do you have a best, a favorite? Oh, favorite. I honestly think it's the hustle content that we've created because it allows them to be part of the message and personalize it for themselves. I mean, truly, because there's our competitive threats, our needs are so nuanced by local market. It would be impossible for me to run enough of the creative given, you know, we don't have unlimited budgets. So it allows the network to take that creative and put it out into their market based on what their needs are or what their opportunities are what they're up against so for me I think it's just that that Remax hustle site has been such a valuable piece for the network but I love what Meredith just said too to go back to that because I think it's not about the media the tactic the whatever it's about people and what do people need and how does your product service value fit that and that's what I think if as marketers if we focus on that that true experience you're going to win you're going to learn and you're going to test and make mistakes along the way but that to me is what's so powerful I think that that is the essence of our entire industry. If we could all just remember that it's about people, the whole process is about people, helping people solve problems. What is the problem? What is our solution? Um, no one likes to be sold anything. I can tell you that having been in sales my whole career, <laughs> once you know you're being sold, people start to shut down. Um, <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about new technologies or channels that you're excited about. Is there anything that you would point to whether or something that you're planning on using and how do you test those things? I would say, you know, for me, these, these aren't new. I'm going to sound so not cool, but you know, the things <laughs> that I think are extremely interesting for us are gaming, of course. Um, you know, it's, people are watching gaming it's nuts you know and I hadn't even really seen it until the pandemic and watching my husband be on twitch and all these platforms I was like what are you doing um you know but I really think you know it is just booming and it's it's not kids it's adults um, now it's as polygon says everyone is a gamer yes everyone is a gamer but you know like adults are doing this um as and I think especially as like there's content overload like maybe they don't want to sit and watch a video or watch TV or watch an app, you know, watch a movie, right? Like there's so many other things to do. So, you know, I'm really fascinated by gaming and just the opportunities to integrate content there. And then the other one is podcasts. Like I think um, it's such an interesting space where, you know, you've got loyal listeners. There's such a habitual process there where people, you know, they are, they get up every day, even when they're not commuting right now and they still listen to the same podcast over and over. Um, and I think it's such a unique opportunity for brands to be able to integrate into podcasts and reach a consistent audience, either with the same message or to storytell over time, right? Because it's such a loyal listener base um, for specific podcasts that I just think it's like a big opportunity that, you know, candidly, we haven't tapped into quite yet from 
truly a content integration standpoint, but I think it's 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 a big passion of mine and something that's on my my to do list. Well, then we have a lot to talk about. We'll, we'll put a <laughs> pin in that and come back because because the Vox Media Podcast Network. One thing that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic is exactly what you just said. People will were still listening to podcasts even if they were not commuting, and actually listenership went up. We actually just acquired Cafe, which we're super excited about. And I believe podcasts are that super intimate media where someone's literally in your head. It if you feels have headphones intimate. on. Yeah. It feels like they're talking to you and you are of part course. of the conversation. And I feel like it's such a great way for brands to be able to connect with consumers. And, you know, it's still we're still advertising to them, but in a way that's a little bit softer. Um, and because, you know, you're going to have that user over time, like, can you do it in a little bit, um, you know, less overt fashion? That's cool. How about you, James? We have not gotten into gaming podcasts. I definitely agree. Um, especially with the last 18 months we've all gone through it's increased listenership. It's funny. We actually have, we started shifting away from some of our radio and now we've brought back those scripts and those audio message for podcast reasons. Our CEO actually has one called Start With a Win, and it's not an overt sell of Remax. It's a very much mind, body, business type of an approach, how to be good at your business, how to be good personally, um, and it's growing. I think it's got lots of legs. I think for us, what I'm excited about is the integration on and offline. You know, there's been some seems like as we take a few steps forward with regulations and changes, we get kind of thrown back a couple. But yeah. simple things like geofencing billboards or geofencing sponsorships where typically we have signage. Let's see what happens online that we can track a little bit better. Um, even connected TVs, you know, streaming all that. We did an addressable TV uh, test. And how do we keep furthering that along where, again, when we think about people, um, what are they doing? What are their needs? What media are they consuming? What devices are connecting to that Wi-Fi? How do we start to serve messages to very specific households, targeting one, see if the next three, target the next four, based off of what they're doing, maybe what they're not doing, and trying to create and test creative and content to those audiences to keep furthering that conversation and finding out, are they a buyer? Are they a seller? Are they in that research phase? How do we kind of build that brand loyalty and get on that short list of consideration. So it's it's just cool that, that we're finally there where, you know, 10 years ago we were daydreaming about, you know, words I don't want to go to, attribution modeling and all that. But how do we, now we're at finally there with technology and capabilities to bridge those gaps and really look at this in a cool, unique way to drive that consumer experience. Well, so much of that content too, you're right. People dreaming about what, a house they want to look at or places they want to live. And mm -hmm. I just think of that SNL skit where it's like <laughs> <laughs> just hanging yeah. out and looking at what's it's, going on in the real estate market and pretending that you're moving into a house. Anyway, uh, yeah. I definitely feel like I'm in that voyeuristic world. So um, I'm going to go back to at the very intro, you were talking about your journey and where you both come from, but you do have one interest in common that I just want to make sure I ask this question because it, it was fascinating to me reading your profiles that you both have a deep common interest in wellness so Meredith I know you're an athlete you're a fitness enthusiast um, James I know you were digital VP of comms for several health and wellness brands um, what is your best go-to wellness tip maybe something you even learned or used in the last year mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I could like spend an hour talking about this. And by no means am I an expert, uh, but I always go back to Elwood's and like endorphins make you happy. And I truly believe that you will, you will never regret the workout if it's 10 minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes, right? Like I'm, I am, I'm guilty as well as saying, oh, I don't want to, but like at, at the end of the day, I've never regretted it unless I've gotten hurt, but you know, like that I, for me, at least, I feel like moving my body is medicine and it will always just get me in a better mindset. Um, and the other thing is just try, try new things. You know, I was a marathoner for years and then decided, you know, it didn't make me happy anymore. And, you know, I gave it up. Maybe one day I'll be interested in it again, but I moved into strength training and doing other things and teaching spin class. And so like, just allow yourself to evolve. 
James, so, how about you? What's your I best one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I know you really inspired me with Elle Woods. This is my favorite panel ever. <laughs> it's kind of, it's hard to pick one. I think for me, it's, we tend to get on these ideas, especially when you're busy, you're traveling, life is nuts. We fall off that wagon. And then to get back on the wagon, we think we have to have it all dialed in and perfect. We're really just take a bite at a time and consistency matters. For me, it's the mornings. I need to do something for myself. And it's not always just my body. It's definitely the mental side, of it, right? Whether that's, I've been trying to meditate shit. What was that? A podcast. A podcast, yes. <laughs> like how do I just fit some time in in the morning? Um, I read this book. We had this guy speak with us, The Miracle Morning. I love it. It's a way to ground yourself in the day to start what you need and just make sure you're feeding yourself. Love that. I would say my only tip is I move to a standing desk. So during calls, I can stretch, I can kick. That's it. It's made a big difference That's in my energy level. <laughs> exactly. Jesse, we're so glad you're back. What's your awesome. wellness That's tip? <laughs> Oof, I don't know. You shouldn't ask me. I can barely run two miles, but we'll have to bring everyone back for a fitness chat. It'll be fantastic. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. That was such a great conversation. You guys covered so many great topics. So really, thank you so much for coming on today. It was awesome. Thank Thanks you for having us. Bye-bye. Awesome. Have a great one. Great. Um,